There we go. All right. So today we're talking about Joseph, God's champion in exercising forgiveness. We'll see uh, how he was wounded in sin. He was hurt by others, by those who were supposed to love him dearly and protect him. And yet, when he had his chance to have revenge, to get even with them, he instead freely forgave them. And so we'll, we'll look at exercising forgiveness, particularly when we might think forgiveness isn't deserved, right? And our quote for tonight also is from my boy St. Augustine, who says, The measure of love is to love without measure. Right? And this is, it's the measure of love because this is God's measurement of love. This is how God loves us. He loves us without measure. And so the true measure of love is the love that is without measure. Uh, a love without measure, of course, is impossible for any human being to will or feel or do on their own. Uh, okay, so first we're going to look at some background info to the account. We're going to start with a fellow by the name of Jacob, or Israel. Uh, Genesis 37, verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account or the genealogy of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Ooh, we heard about bad reports, right? Uh, this one actually is a, telling the truth. It's just um, uh, it, it, what they were doing was bad, so he told his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. Uh, which is always like, oh boy, here we go. You know, when someone tells you, let me tell you about my dream that I had the other night. It's like, it's probably interesting to you, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I find my, my dreams are interesting to me, but not very many other people. He said to them, listen to this dream. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. All right, so that's a little background info. We're going to look at this family that we've been talking about, uh, Jacob or Israel and his sons. We heard about two of his wives, two of his four wives. We'll take a look at that too. We have the family of Abram or then Abraham. His son Isaac, his son Jacob, then became Israel, right? God changes names when someone changes, when he changes someone's purpose or identity or work that they do. Uh, so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? We've been talking about them the past nights as well, because God is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God that is, I am that I am. Um, oh, you, so here's... Uh, this is uh, Hoy Trace uh, Patriarchi, the three patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Who's, who's Jacob holding in his left hand there? You probably might not be able to see that. It's another little guy. Uh, a really holy little guy. That's uh, Jesus, actually. So the idea is, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob comes the Messiah, Jesus, right? Uh, so here's the so, uh, slimmed down family tree. Right? Abraham married Sarah, uh, Sarai. Isaac loved Rebekah. And Jacob loved Rachel, but got tricked and ended up marrying Leah first, whom he didn't love. 
and then he ended up marrying Rachel. And all he had to do was work 14 years to, to have both wives. Um, we see there's two other wives or mothers of his children there. Bila, who is Rachel's servant, and Zilpah, who is Leah's servant. That's because Jacob loved Rachel but did not love Leah. And Leah, his first wife, technically, although he was deceived into marrying her, uh, grew resentful of Rachel, right? But then, Rachel could not have children. So the only way Jacob could have children was through Leah. So Rachel grew resentful of Leah because she could not have children, but then suddenly, Leah is popping on Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah, right? And so uh, Rachel then said, hey, how about my servant? You have a child with my husband, right? Now we saw that before with Abraham and Sarah, right? Uh, and so Bilah had Dan and Naphtali, and then Leah got jealous and resentful and said, oh, no, 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 get my servant in on it too, because this isn't fair. And so through Zilpah, they had Gad and Asher, right? And then Leah had Issachar and Zebulun. And then, finally, God enabled Rachel to have children, to have a son, Joseph. The firstborn of Jacob's old age of his favorite wife, right? I too have a favorite wife. I only have one wife, but she's my favorite. So. Yeah. She's the favorite. And then the the youngest of the twelve brothers, Benjamin, Benjamin, right? So this is where they got the idea of soap operas. Right? Yeah, yeah. A very Old Testament. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, soap operas are nothing new. We're, we'll see that very clearly here. Uh, so out of Israel's, Jacob's 13 children, 12 boys, one girl. So if you were the only girl in your family with, you know, two or three boy siblings, <laughs> think about what that must be like. Who was Jacob's favorite child? Joseph. Joseph, yes, Joseph. Why was Joseph his favorite? He's the first child. Yes, the firstborn of his favorite wife, Rachel, and the child of his old age, right? So he's, um, you, you know, you might see grandparents spoil their grandchildren more than parents spoil their children sometimes, right? So it's sort of a particularly favorite, um, uh, from his favorite wife in a particularly favorite time of life as well. Um, and his other uh, children were either from servants of his wives or from the wife that he didn't particularly care for, but had been tricked into marrying. So, he makes it very clear that he has a favorite son, which is never a good idea, right? Uh, to make it clear to your kids which one is your favorite, um, you, you, you probably, I, you know, if you're a parent, I don't know if you have a favorite child or not, it's not a good idea to have a favorite child. I, I don't have, have a favorite child. child and she's my favorite. I like, if you have one, then yeah, of course, that's I your favorite. Two. Yeah. My son is my favorite my child and my daughter. There you go. Your favorite son and your favorite daughter. I like that. Yeah. I have a favorite son and mom. <laughs> <laughs> He's like an only one. I'm like Peter Ryan. Exactly. Yeah. I can tell you one too. I have eight grandkids. Mm -hmm. One sitting here. He calls himself. Yeah, that's, that's what you gotta do. Yeah. If, if you say enough, she'll start to believe it, you know? So, yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, no, that's what happens. Yeah. 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 They all know about it, right? And there's many giveaways. One of the giveaways that were given here is a special gift that Joseph gives only to Jacob. What was the special gift that he gives to Jacob? A coat of many colors. A coat of many colors. Yes. Are you sure? It just says a robe. Are you positive? It just says a robe. Is it a coat of many colors? A ornamented robe. Ornamented robe. Does anyone have a different translation? Mine was richly ornamented. Yeah. So a Christmas sweater? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a good Christmas sweater. I mean, he's got uh, he's got baby Jesus in his hand, so yeah. I mean, 
There it is, it's a Christmas sweater. Uh, he, he, he gives them a coat that um, we don't exactly know what the word means. It's often translated or shown as a coat of many colors. Uh, and you'll see that a lot in especially artwork and paintings and uh, musicals, uh, for example. Uh, but we actually aren't 100% sure what it means. It's related to the word for breadth, like a hand breadth. Uh, so it, it, it's actually probably more likely means the coat of long sleeves or many breadths. So it has a lot of hand breadth length of fabric. And so it was very rich dress. Just a tunic? Yeah. Okay, it doesn't give a description at all? No. Okay. Tunic of many colors, that's it. Oh, of many colors. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, because the King James went with many colors. Um, and uh, King James doesn't always get these translations 100% correct because they're very uh, England in the late 1500s, early 1600s. So they'll, they'll say corn. They'll use the word corn. There is no corn in the Bible. It did not exist in the Old Testament or New Testament. But they used the word corn because they had corn in England, right? Um, and I think that, 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 that King James translation might be where it sort of entered our culture as the coat of many colors. It could be a coat of many colors. It could be a, a particularly uh, like ornamented coat. It might have many fine ornaments on it. Uh, it, it, it was distinctive, it was expensive, it was very precious, no matter what. So it, you'll, you'll probably see like many colors, you might see the long sleeve, a coat of long sleeves, a coat of many hand breaths, a coat of rich ornaments, a coat of royalty, you might hear that sometimes, uh, a coat of amazing technicolor, that's another translation that's been gone with before. Uh, what are the reasons Joseph's brothers are jealous of him? This is one of them, this coat. What, what are some others? Because yeah, it was his dreams. father's favorite. His father's favorite, yeah? His dreams. dreams. The dreams he had, right? He had yeah. dreams where he said, hey, look how great I am. You all are going to bow down to me. Right? Isn't that wonderful? Don't you love that? Right? <laughs> so I'm sure you do, Joseph, you know? Uh, but that's one of the things that we'll learn about Joseph is he, he has prophetic dreams and can interpret prophetic dreams as well when no one else can. Uh, any other reasons? Because Joseph gave him this special gift, because, or Jacob gave him this special gift, he was Jacob's favorite, he had these dreams where he was like, oh, you're going to bow down to me. He, he didn't have to work, he wasn't a shepherd, right? Like his brothers, he didn't have to work. He, he wasn't out working when all the other boys were out working. And in fact, he was the one his father sent to go check on him to make sure they were doing okay, you know? So he was like the middle manager, you know, that comes in and, yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, he's the, he's the guy from head office that comes in to make sure you're doing your job right, right? Um, you know, he's, he comes down and says, what exactly do you do here? Yeah. Uh, so we, what, we, what we see is we have messed up families, right? This family is a messed up family, a dysfunctional family. There's four mothers... For 13 kids, there is bitterness and jealousy and resentment between the wives. There's bitterness and resentment and jealousy between the children. And what we actually see in Jacob and Isaac and Abraham is that this is not just a Joseph and his brother's problem. This is not just a Jacob and his wife's problem. This is an Isaac and Rebecca problem. This is an Abraham and Sarah problem. This is generational sins of jealousy and deception. <clears throat> Generational. The sins of the parents become the sins of the children, despite the parents' best efforts to make their kids better than they are. Yet, their kids see, their kids hear, their kids watch. And so the sins that tempt the parents, that the parents fall into, are observed by the kids, and the kids take them on themselves, right? We do see this happening. Right? That these sins sort of become generational. Very, very difficult to root in. And the particular sins are jealousy and deception. Lies. We have Jacob who pulled everybody's leg. He was a liar, a deceiver. His name, Jacob, Yaakov, means uh, he, he, he pulls your heel, he pulls your leg. Because he came out of the womb holding Esau's ankle, right? 
uh, to the heel grabber. That's where we get the phrase, I'm pull he's, you're pulling my leg. It's from it's Jacob, because he pulled his brother's leg, and then he deceived his brother and his father, right? He was a deceiver. He lied. Uh, and it did not go well with him, right? And we have jealousy between Jacob, the second-born twin, and Esau, who has the birthright. And because of that jealousy, uh, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, convinces her favorite child, Jacob, to deceive her husband, Isaac, to get the birthright for himself, right? So you see deception, jealousy, husband against wife, sibling against sibling, um, and parents against children, and it, yeah. Uh, I, Isaac, his father, deceived and lied. He, he said, he traveled in a foreign land and said to a foreign king, this beautiful woman, Rebecca, is not my wife, this is my sister. And so the ruler thought, well, then she'll be my wife. How about that? Um, but then, of course, he found out that it was Isaac's wife and not sister, and he said, why did you lie to me about that, right? Why did he lie to, to him about that? He learned it from his father, right? That's exactly what his father did twice. Abraham did that with Sarah twice to two different rulers. And actually, one of the rulers was the same ruler that Isaac lied to about his wife being his sister. The same guy. And he's probably like, well, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Oh, shame. Shame on you also. Like, don't fool another person twice. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah had their own share of jealousy and deception, right? Uh, Abraham, of course, deceiving others about Sarah, but then Sarah, uh, who could also not uh, have children, and so she had her handmaiden have a child with Abraham. That child was Ishmael, right? And then Isaac was the, the second born, the child of promise. Ishmael was the child, uh, Paul calls him the child of um, slavery or servitude. Uh, but then Sarah and her handmaid like, hates her handmaid. Uh, and so you see this resentment, jealousy, deception again and again in this family. It keeps happening again and again. It's probably a good bet that they didn't all sit down and eat together, right? <laughs> yeah, you think your Thanksgivings are awkward. I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> so where did where 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 do uh, Jacob's sons learn their jealousy and deception? They learn it from watching Jacob. Where did Jacob learn it from watching Isaac? Where did Isaac learn it from watching Abraham? Right. So the children inherit and perpetuate the sins they saw in their parents. This is why it's so important for parents not only to put the Word of God into the heads and hands and hearts of their children, I saw the same night cry, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, not only put the Word of God into their children's heads and hands and hearts, but live by example. Live the Word. In particularly, in the God-pleasing life, but when you inevitably fail at the God-pleasing life as a parent, in repentance and forgiveness, right? Modeling for our kids our repentance for what we've done wrong for our sins, and our forgiveness, the forgiveness Jesus gives us, because that's the only way to break these sins in our own life and from then, like, you know, perpetuating them in the lives of others, too. The forgiveness of Christ that he gives to us. Repentance. Receiving that forgiveness and repentance. And turning away from sin. Uh, so yeah, they learned it from watching their parents. Right? Maybe you remember this one. Like, where did you, where did you learn to do all that stuff? You know, to smoke that pot. From you, Dad. I learned it from watching you. Remember that commercial? Okay. <laughs> they learned it from their parents. And yet, this is Jesus' family. Right? These are Jesus' forefathers, right? His parents, long before, right? He chooses to be born into this messed up family. This is, uh, this is God's own family. Because he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the family he chooses to eventually produce the Messiah and bless all the nations of the earth through Abraham's offspring, right? God chooses for himself not the perfect human family, but the messed up human family, right? And to me, that's a tremendous comfort. 
right? That when we have family dysfunction, when our families are messed up to some degree or another, um, you know, God is there with us. Because Jesus was born into messed up families. If you trace all of Jesus' <laughs> ancestors, there's some really solid, faithful people there. There's some pretty messed up people and pretty messed up things there, too. Because the whole point is, that's what he's saving them from. That's what he's forgiving. That's what he's reconciling and restoring to himself, right? So despite the messed up families, God works in the brokenness of sin, right? To bless, to restore, and to heal with his grace and his forgiveness. So it's not that God works with those who have no sin. He works amidst the brokenness of sin to heal the brokenness. To restore people and families to salvation in God. To bring his love and grace so that we can bring it to others as well. So how can these sinful men and families be called righteous? The righteous forefathers of our faith? Through Jesus. Through Jesus. Yeah, how so? Because we're called righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross and forgave us our sins. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So despite this this messed up stuff, despite their own sins and failings, and then failing to be a good uh, example to their kids, and then seeing those same sins in their kids. Despite that, we have these uh, people of the faith, the forefathers, the patriarchs, right? Who were righteous not by their lack of sin, but righteous by their faith, right? They are justified by faith. What does justification mean? Just as if I never said, there you go, yeah, right? It is declared righteous by God for the sake of Jesus. For Jesus' holy life, keeping the law perfectly, we are declared righteous by God through faith. For Jesus being the perfect offering for our sin, forgiving all of our sins on the cross, we are declared to be sinless. Our sins actually forgiven by Jesus, right? So that is... Justification. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was declared to be his by God himself because of his faith in the Messiah that would come through his offspring. Right? And so all of these passages are uh, about Abraham uh, being justified by his faith, being declared righteous by his faith. And then also, not only are they just declared righteous, and then they just sort of say, oh, I'm good. You know, I can just take it easy, I can sort of sin, I can live how I want, I can do what I want. <laughs> like, that's a dead faith, right? That's not saving faith, because that's a dead faith. Then also, they put that faith to work in their life. This faith shows itself in repentance, in the fruit of repentance, our love for God and love for each other, our forgiveness of each other. It shows itself in our trust of God, our daily walk with God, right? And the forgiveness we receive from him and give to others, right? God's forgiving is for giving, right? He forgives us, we give it to others as well. So, they are justified by God, uh, justified by their faith, but their faith is never passive or dead, right? After justification comes sanctification, faith in action, faith through works, the natural works that result from faith in God. Right? Uh, so this makes the point that Abraham believed God, he was justified by faith, but he also had then had works, right, that followed naturally from his faith. Uh, all right, so we'll, we'll pick up here, Genesis 37. Uh, that's the background information, the conflict between Joseph and his brothers, and then also this uh, emphasis on messed up families, but the forgiveness and reconciliation that's offered in Jesus. Uh, we will skip ahead a little bit to verse 17b, the second half of verse 17. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams." When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. 
Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to the, his father. So they say, we're going to kill Joseph and throw his body in the cistern, the empty well. And uh, then Reuben says, let's not kill him. You can throw him in the well. That's fine. Whatever. You know, uh, you know that's what brothers do to each other. Um, my ancestors threw each other into waterfalls in Norway. So I guess this is the equivalent of that. Um, don't, he says, don't lay a hand on him. Don't kill him. Just put him in the well. Reuben is going to come back later by himself and rescue Joseph to restore him to his father. That's his plan, right? So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented, many-colored, amazing, technicolor, dream coat, royal, uh, many handbreadths robe that he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. What a nice guy Judah is. Let's not kill him, he's our brother. Come on, let's just sell him into slavery. <laughs> So when the Midianite merchants, the uh, Midianites are the Ishmaelites, when they came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. Uh, interestingly enough, 20 shekels of silver later becomes the amount of money to redeem a, a male, an adult male, from temple service. So... You, you redeem the adult male for the same price that Joseph was sold into slavery. That's in Leviticus. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. So he got clothes tearing again, right? He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't here. Where can I turn now? All right. Well, good question. Yeah. How much, remind me, Judas, how many silver pieces did he have? 30. 30 pieces of silver, yeah. So a little bit more, you know, for, for the Son of God and then for just a normal human man, right? Uh, what did Joseph's brothers first want to do to him? And kill him. Kill him. Why did they want to kill him? Because they didn't want him to go around him. Yeah, you know, he's going to keep telling us his dreams. He's going to keep being the favorite. Well, we have an opportunity just between us to kill him, throw him in the well, and say that some animal killed him and devoured him, right? Uh, a little extreme, but it shows the anger, the resentment, the hatred that had built up. Right? Which wife was Reuben? Uh, Reuben was Leah. Reuben was the firstborn. Yep. So what did they do instead? And why did they change their minds? They sold him to make some money. They sold him into slavery because they thought, hey, here we go, right? Let's, let's not kill him. What a waste. What a waste of human life when we can make money off of human life, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So they changed their minds because they thought, hey, we could, you know, get a little, little spending money here. And we, we could get rid of Joseph. He goes away with the Midianites, which are the Ishmaelites. How does them selling Joseph to the Ishmaelites add insult to the injury they've already done to Joseph? Turn him into a slave. Turn him into a slave. Why, why does selling them to the Ishmaelites make it even worse for Joseph, oh, son of Jacob, the son of Isaac? Were yeah. yeah, they were distant kin, right? Because they were Abraham's son, and Isaac was Abraham's son. But, but they were not friendly kin, right? That was Ishmael and Isaac. And they sort of went their separate ways and God promised that will make the Ishmaelites a great nation, right? And then once again, we have generational things happening, two brothers hating each other and <coughs> Jacob and Esau, right? So Esau, we have the Edomites and the Israelites, and they also were, you know, hating each other throughout history. So it adds insult to injury because they sold him from the, the line of promise from Isaac 
to the line of slavery, the line of being thrown out in the wilderness, the, the line that does not receive the promise in Ishmael, right? So they're not only selling him into slavery, they're selling him out of the birthright of the Messiah. That is the insult that's added to the, just the injury of being sold into slavery in the first place. So that's what makes this very interesting, that it's Ishmaelites in particular that are mentioned, that they sell him to. Why does Reuben ask, where can I turn now? Why is Reuben so dismayed and none of the other brothers? He was going to take him back to his father. He was going to take him back to his father, yeah. Why, why is he wondering, now what, now what can I do? What am I going to do? Because he was willing to work with them, say, hey, do this, and go with them to the throne of his sister, and then he'll come back and rescue them mm -hmm. after they're gone. Yeah. Now he can't. Mm -hmm. Now he's gone, gone. Yeah, right. Yeah. So he, he can't rescue Joseph. Now he's gone into slavery. Who knows where, right? Um, and why is it Reuben that cares so much about Joseph in the first place when none of the other brothers do? And Reuben doesn't particularly like Joseph, but why does Reuben, why is Reuben the one that wants to save him and despairs when he's gone? I think he was thinking about his father. Yeah, I sure. He was the first one. He was... What was that? Because he was the firstborn. He was the firstborn. So all those other brothers are his responsibility. If the other brothers kill Joseph, it's on him. He's the one that has to answer to it and pay for it, right? That's why he's dismayed about Joseph. That's why he wants to rescue Joseph. Because his own life might be forfeit, uh, depending on how Jacob wants to handle the situation, right? Especially if it's his favorite son that was on the chopping block. Uh, so, yeah, the firstborn had the birthright, but then had all the responsibility of all the other siblings as well, right? If anything happened to them, it was the oldest, the oldest brother in particular that I had to answer for. Uh, is this the only time when something like this happens to Joseph? He's, uh, he's hated and he's thrown into a pit. No. And, no? When, when else does it happen? When he's in Egypt. When he's in Egypt, when he, he gets to Egypt. Prison. Yeah, he's sold as a slave, he does really well. He's sold to Potiphar, who's the head of the, the guard, which could mean the bodyguards of Pharaoh, could he mean the executioners of Pharaoh. Also the leader and, of the prison. What's that? He was also the leader of the Yes, prison. right, yeah. Um, so he's, he's in the household of Potiphar, who's maybe the, the, the head bodyguard of Pharaoh, or the head executioner of Pharaoh, or the head butcher of Pharaoh. Uh, the word is he's the, the head slaughterer, and we don't know exactly what that means. So he could be the bodyguard who slaughters enemies, he could be the executioner who slaughters prisoners, he could be the slaughterer of cows for the, the, the dinner table, right? Um, but then, yeah, so he, he works his way up there. Then, uh, you know, Potiphar's wife, uh, you know, wants to get a little friendly with him, and he says no. And so then she, uh, you know, makes it seem like, she takes his cloak and makes it seem like Joseph was the one who was trying to get friendly with her, and Joseph gets thrown in the dungeon, right? Because of deception and resentment, he gets thrown in the pit. And then he works his way up in the pit, and then he gets forgotten and never makes it out. But then finally he makes it out, and he works his way all the way up to be second to Pharaoh. Uh, so it's a, you know, throw me in a pit once, shame on you. Throw me in a pit twice, still shame on you. Don't throw people in the pits once or twice, or three times, or any other time. Uh, all right, so we, we see these same things happening to Joseph, right? He's in a really good standing, and then he goes down into the pit when all is lost and all is hopeless. And then he builds it back up, or rather God builds it back up it says again and again in these chapters, God is with him, God is with him, God is with him. Even in the dungeon, God is with him, God is with him, God is with him. And then he builds it back up, and then Joseph is brought back down into the pit, right? Can't ever seem to win. So Genesis 37, 31. Uh, the brothers, then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. 
Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning will I go down to the grave, to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, or the royal slaughterers. What makes the brother's story about Joseph so despicable? The lies. Yeah. The lies to their own father. <laughs> that they would lie to their father about one of his sons being killed when really they sold that son into slavery, right? Yeah. Just a bold-faced lie to one that they should honor and respect and love and cherish, right? I have that movie, uh, Joseph the Mid Coat of Many Colors with mm -hmm. Donnie Osmond in it. Oh, yeah. And it's I've never seen quite that. comical <laughs> and quite amusing to watch. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. We, uh, we get a very different type of story from the scriptures, though. Mm -hmm. uh, very dark and very sorrowful. Yeah. yeah. And it's a good reminder when we hear of Joseph that through being locked in the pit in the darkness and slavery and all of these terrible things, God is with him. Right? Mm -hmm. So when we are in the pit, when we're in sorrow and suffering and darkness, it's not because God has left us. Rather, he's there with us. Because look at the sorrow that Jesus suffered. That shows he's with you, right, in your sorrow and suffering. So we can't go, we can't determine God's presence in our lives based on what's happening around us or how we feel within us. We determine God's presence in our lives by what God says about it. And he says, I am with you always, to the end of the world. What's the tragic irony of Jacob's sons using a garment and a goat to deceive him? <laughs> because he did the same thing. <laughs> Jacob did the same to Isaac, right? Yeah. He, put, he took a goat skin and wore it so he could be hairy like his brother Esau. Or, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. So he put the, the goat skin on to be hairy. And through a garment and a goat, he deceived his father. To get the birthright. See, so we see this cycle, right, of deception. It just keeps happening. And so now the deceiver is himself deceived in a very similar way. Right? It's going to come back from bite him in the hind end. <laughs> it, it always does, doesn't it? Yeah. Our lies always do that. <laughs> yep. yep. How did God equip and strengthen Joseph to face all of his trials? Through his faith. Through Joseph's faith, yeah, yeah. His, his trust that God is there, yeah. no matter what happens. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. Through that word that God had given to Abraham, that Abraham proclaimed, and then through that word that was passed down. Despite the frailty, the messed upness of the families and their sins, the word was also passed down alongside it. That's why the forgiveness is the important thing here, right? Because we all have messed up, sinful natures, and we need the forgiveness, the repentance, Jesus' own absolution, as the solution to all of our brokenness. When God died, and Jesus died on the cross, mm -hmm. he took care of all our sins. Yeah, and absolutely. So that's exactly where we go for, with our sins, for forgiveness of them. That's exactly what we bring to others when we forgive their sins, too. Uh, so this is actually a good transition here. Thank you very much. In what ways does Joseph's life foreshadow Jesus' life and work? There's a number of ways that things that happen to Joseph or things that Joseph does in his life uh, are very similar and line up with things Jesus does and accomplishes. Of course, Jesus does it perfectly and better. But the Old Testament is there to foreshadow Jesus in a number of ways. What are some things from Joseph's life that remind us of Jesus and what he did for us? Forgiveness. Forgiveness, yeah, absolutely, right? First and foremost, yeah. forgiveness when it isn't deserved. Yeah, right? he gave his brothers. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. What Joseph was taken to, to Egypt and Jesus was also taken to Egypt. Yeah, very good, right? Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt. Jesus was hidden away in Egypt to prevent being murdered. Someone wanted to murder Jesus, too. And he went to Egypt. They Just like they wanted to murder Joseph, and he went to Egypt. Yeah. Uh, the, the king of the Jews wanted to murder the king of the Jews, right? So, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's really good. Any others? And his own brother, the king of Joseph. His own brothers betrayed him, right? Uh, we might think of Judas, yeah. first and foremost. But then all of Jesus' apostles, except for John, ran away. John is the only one who's at the cross, right? Um, and so we see also Jesus' own brothers. And there's a psalm that talks about Judas that says, my own brother who shared my bread has betrayed me, has turned away from me. Right? Well, also, Jesus, uh, or Joseph had to put away food for the famine for the people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He, he fed the people in a spiritual famine. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd and had compassion on them. And he taught them the word, the bread of life, and he fed them bread in the wilderness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I thought in particular of um, when Jesus is thrown in, or Joseph is thrown into the pit. Uh, Jesus also gets thrown into the pit of the grave, right? When Joseph is thrown into the pit, his garment is stripped from him and soaked in blood. And when Jesus, the Lamb of God, goes to the cross, his garment is stripped and sold off, and Jesus is soaked in blood. The blood of the Lamb, the holy blood of the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Right? So we, we could actually go on and on about this. There's a lot of various parallels, and that's intentional. God did that intentionally, right? In the, the lives of the people in the Old Testament and in their witness, he is setting it up. He's setting his Messiah up so that people recognize him. And accept him, right, as the Messiah. Because they can go to the Word, the Old Testament. They can go to history, the very history that was recorded in the Word of God, to say, hey, he's checking all of these boxes, right? So, yeah, just as everyone in the line of the Messiah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then, you know, down to David and so on, um, all, all of them foreshadow Jesus in particular ways. Uh, all right, let's take a quick break, five-minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll learn about the end of the story. Okay.